great panel here talking about brands innovating in and out of the, out of the building. I'm Laura Mignot, I'll be your moderator, asking the tough questions. Uh, I always like to start off a panel by having the panelists tell us what they're up to and who they are. So I'll start with Frank on the end. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Frank. I'm originally from France. I co-founded a nonprofit named Startup Weekend. Anyone here know Startup Weekend? Yeah. But if you don't know it, go to it. Uh, another tip for you if you're for New Yorkers and people in New Jersey, go to Startup Digest. Go to Gary's Guide. It's a newsletter. And you'll get what to, uh, what to do to, uh, to uh, learn and connect to entrepreneurship. You get a, a weekly newsletter that tells you what to do. So go to Startup Weekend if you haven't been. Uh, done that for seven years, six years. Scaled it to 140 countries. We had uh, 400,000 entrepreneurs who've been through that program. Crazy things happen with that. And long story short, now I'm launching a new startup. It's called ReCorp. And the idea is to take this entrepreneurial energy and try to change the way big boring corporation works from the inside. So try to shake it. Hi, I'm Michael Kaplan and I'm not French. <laughs> then you're and, off and, the panel, and, sorry. And, uh, more American now, I guess. It's only French, yeah. And uh, hopefully we're not a big boring corporation either. But uh, we have a multi-channel fashion experience that's... Um, a very interesting business, I guess, for this panel and also the world we're living through now in that, um, you know, we're right at the epicenter of what's changing in the retail and fashion environment with stores and online and digital. Um, so we're a fashion company that provides um, on-trend apparel, 200 styles a month across various categories of a woman's lifestyle um, at a 40% discount to what they typically find out there. And the nuance that we have is that we're solely focused on women sizes 12 and up. So we're really like, a, think of us as like an H&M in a specialty store format for size 14 and up. So that's what we do. Hello, I am Melissa McLean. I am the Director of Partnership Marketing for Six Flags. So definitely not a boring company. Um, if you don't know what Six Flags is, we are the lar world's largest regional theme park company. So we have 18 locations. What I'm up to right now is uh, opening roller coasters. So it's Memorial Day, so we're opening up all our new coasters, and we have some really cool ones that uh, we're going to talk about in a little bit. Very cool. Uh, I'm Evan. I was asked to do the sonic branding for Propeller, so here goes. Okay, just kidding. Um, so I'm with Gray Advertising. Uh, we just launched a new group called Gray Adventures. Not to be confused with Great Adventure. But we will. Um, although we want to go there, so let's get some passes. Um, and we are starting up a whole new practice at Gray, which is essentially putting out creative capital into the startup ecosystem, so not exactly venture capital, where we're really bringing in early stage companies, helping them grow, helping innovate from within Gray, bring them to our clients, which are the Fortune 100, um, and really start to kind of get into that whole ecosystem. Awesome. See? Great group. So, Melissa, because got to start with you first. All right. Um, how has Six Flags been innovating in and out of the building? So, obviously, we're doing a lot of innovating out of the building because we're Six Flags. So, we have some of the coolest, coolest coasters, um, the fastest, the tallest, constantly trying to stay relevant. Um, the most recent news that you may have heard about is that we have announced earlier this year that Samsung is our official technology partner. And with that, we launched the first virtual, virtual reality coasters. So this is not to be confused with putting on the headset, sitting down there and riding a coaster. We are actually taking Gear VR and putting it on our roller coasters. So when you're on that ride, you are going through the coaster, you're going through the lift, you're going through all the loops and you are in a fighter jet fighting off aliens and saving the world. Or you're flying with Superman. So huge new, um, new attraction for us. Kind of takes everything, the greatest part, it's powered by a Samsung phone. So these guests who are experiencing the gear, or gear VR, they can actually go purchase that. So it's a great partnership for Samsung as they get this, uh, this new technology out to consumers. Um, so yeah, I mean, great. We've launched four coasters. Fifth one is this weekend. Superman is in the next couple of weeks. PR, guest feedback has been huge. No one's getting sick. Everyone's loving it. We actually worked with a special company to create the content. It is actually designed to react to the coaster, the pattern of the coaster, so you don't ever get sick. It's literally your head knows you're going down a lift. That's what the fighter jet's doing. So definitely innovating over at Six Flags. Sounds awesome. Michael, 
So tell us more about what you guys are doing for kind of creating offline and online experience in the fashion to figure. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's an interesting question and it's an interesting topic for um, the fashion industry and the retail industry right now. Um, I think everybody's talking about the death of the store. Everybody's talking about, um, you know, it, should the mall exist anymore? Everybody's talking about uh, tremendous disruption going on out there. And, you know, one of the things that's always interesting to us at, at FTF um, <clears throat> is our business has roots 117 years ago in our market. Uh, the plus size clothing market was founded in the 1890s, uh, actually by my great grandmother, who started a company that's called Lane Bryant. Um, the woman Lane Bryant, that's a, a billion dollar company today, was my great grandmother. And um, we, we take that history and we utilize it in what we do at FTF. So with regard to innovation, we always think about what's going on in today's marketplace in the context of what a business like that must have been dealing with. It's really interesting to think about our challenges today as compared to a business that um, had the invention of the automobile happen when it was nine years old or a business that had you know, the invention of the catalog just during the Great Depression. So when we think about today's landscape, you know, we try to keep perspective and understand really what a retailer does and stay with that, which is what is the emotional connection you have and relationship you have to your customer? How do you maintain fabulous product to drive that relationship? And then simply follow the customer across all the platforms, whether it be online or offline like you've talked about. So specifically with our company, People can at any time on a mobile device or any mall in eight states across America or online or in a store buying our product wholesale or going to a third party marketplace online. Through any medium that the customer wants, we focus on great product and making sure that it's across all those paradigms for her to, ex for her to experience us. And frankly, we think that whether it's today's disruption or the disruption of 100 years ago, that's what our job as a retail fashion brand is. Stay with the customer, make the relationship around product, and make sure that you're expert at all the things going on out there, just like people have done for hundreds of years. Awesome. <clears throat> so Frank, you've spent a career working with startups and helping startups work with brands. What are some kind of key points that you think would be some must-haves when startups are looking to partner and work with brands? Um, I worked with big companies too. I started my career at PricewaterhouseCooper, so I've been, I've been on both sides. Um, just want to have a question for you guys. Who here works for, uh, as a job, like in a company? Can you raise your hand? All right. Who here is an entrepreneur? Oh, it's 50-50, so we're good. I think, I mean, a couple of things. Like, uh, first of all, I don't come from the brand side. It's like, that would be marketing. Uh, I, like, a more of a the general business. But I think brand, brand is something interesting. Uh, I think today's value on the market, like, when you look at any company, uh, I don't know, some of, the, some of the sponsor you've got there, like 80% of the value that's on the market is, is the brand. It's intangible. It's not something you can grasp. Uh, Michael, uh, uh, sorry, Peter uh, uh, Drucker, uh, we did management, we invented management, said that a big company does, or company's function is only to do two things. One is marketing, and the second one is innovating. And everything else is useless, or it's cost. It's not useless, it's necessary. Um, so going back to your question, about like what are these things? I think there's two, two things we understand now that have changed maybe in the past five years versus 100 years ago, but, but you're right. It's like both very fundamental things, like focus on the customer, but what has changed? And I think two things have changed. Number one, it's never been so cheap and so easy. Uh, you can be sitting at home with 2,000 bucks and open a business that's gonna reach out to a lot of people. And that's very new. And for a corporation, it's frightening because it means anyone can compete with them potentially. Secondly, uh, it means also that, you know, in terms of, of brand, like you can build something very fast. So speed have changed. Uh, the last thing we know very recently, and it looks very stupid, but for some of you who have been in business school, like the way it used to work is do a business plan and then launch your thing. What we now know is that a startup is not a smaller version of a big company. That's what Steve Blank have been saying for a while. And so I think all these things are very interesting. Big companies exist, but you have to remember that they used to be small. And I think we're entering right now, what I'm excited about is how this whole thing is gonna is gonna work. So well, we're gonna talk about it right now. But like, just want to uh, just want to say right now, I'm learning from both sides. It's changing right now, and we're all learning. Yeah, I think it's a con it's constant evolution of learning on both sides. So Evan, as the agency guy here, um, what's been some success stories when you guys have done these inter interesting partnerships? We are bringing in startups, working with brands for your for clients. So how are you guys measuring that? 
So we obviously have some pretty amazing brands of the P&G, Marriott, Volvo, sort of echelon. Um, and, you know, what we've seen is that most of these brands in some way, shape, or form are facing disruption in the marketplace, whether that's new entrants and upstarts. Um, and so really they rely on us to help them through that you know, challenge. So really what our sort of premise is now is that if we can create new product, new utility, real business value for them outside of what we would consider traditional marketing and advertising, that is you know, when we win and when they win. So we recently did a campaign for Volvo um, where we actually built a new product called Life Paint. Maybe somebody of you have heard of that. Um, it's essentially uh, a physical product, a spray paint product that is invisible during the day, but highly reflective with uh, you know, automobile uh, headlights on it. So it's actually meant to create a safer environment for driving, but not from within the vehicle, actually the environment around them. So cyclists and pedestrians who could actually put on this you know, spray paint and create a more safe environment. Um, so that's actually a joint venture where we brought in partners, built the product, and actually have a stake in that business, in life paint, um, which is a, a very cool sort of new way that we're working with partners outside of, again, television spots and you know, digital advertising. Very cool. And for all of you guys, I guess a big question is, when you guys are looking at doing partnerships, what are the things that you've learned, sort of some best practices? Um, Melissa can start. <laughs> so I would say one of the things that you know we realize now, and it kind of just echoes everything we've been saying, is people don't like to be advertised at. They're savvy now. And so, so many of our corporate partners, yes, I could throw a sign anywhere throughout a Six Flags Park and I can share your advertising. What we're looking for are ways to still get that message across but be endemic to the experience. So obviously the Samsung example, when you can build it into attraction, that's endemic. But even what you were saying, people are shopping on their phones all the time. They're also waiting up to two hours for a ride at our park. So if there's a way to integrate, don't share that guys. But, um, but yeah, if there's a way to integrate something with mobile commerce or something while you're, you're in that park experience, it doesn't feel like advertising. It's actually becoming useful now. So looking for, for ways like that to kind of reach your audience without letting them, or without them knowing you're doing it on purpose. Kind of becoming a utility for them. Yeah, and I, <clears throat> I would echo exactly what she was saying in the sense that, um, but, but even get a little bit more granular about that, which is really, I think the great point you made was to pay attention to people's behavior and really understand how to follow people's behavior and that make sure that the partnership uh, allows you to, to accommodate that behavior and um, tap into that. If you partner with a business that has different values than you do, if you partner with a business that doesn't believe in those same things that you do, that has a different agenda than you do, the partnership will fail. You know, we, we partner all over the world with suppliers. We partner uh, all over the retail landscape with third-party retailers of our product. We partner with technology providers, manufacturers, designers, I mean, you name it. One of the great things about retail and a product business is literally a thousand hands touch our product before the customer sees it. If at any point people feel differently about, as she was saying, accommodating consumer behavior in today's new landscape, if at any point people d deviate in their beliefs or vision from us, the product will not end up right for them. So in terms of partnership in your question, um, I think it's really coming together with people that see this changing landscape, but at the same time maintain being anchored in, guided by the customer, guided by someone's behavior. You know, I couldn't possibly partner with Six Flags and say, hey, let's ignore that people are waiting for rides just because at our company people want instant gratification of a cell phone. Those things have to mutually exist for the consumer that's the same across both companies behaving different ways across both platforms. I think those are very important things to take into account for a partnership that sometimes get lost in big companies, big company silos, or certain companies' agendas. I totally agree with what you guys said. I, would, I think uh, I'm trying to be useful for you guys, so I'm going to try to maybe give you an advice or two, but I think the joint venture is the right way to do it, and the alignment is important, and I think it can happen two ways. One, it can come from the inside. And I would encourage anyone here who works in a big company to think about like if you would create a joint venture, what would you propose and try to pitch it and see what happens. Uh, I think the wrong way, I mean, the way people think about it is usually with startups and big companies and I think now we're gonna go down to people, like community. It's, uh, there's ways, like there's the best way to launch something that's aligned with your company is to trust one of your intrapreneurs, someone from the inside who would be like, 
you know what, I want to do this thing, it makes sense for you. And we can do that only outside, not in the inside. So I do think we're going to see more and more things like that happening. I think corporations are about to change. They're about to become more entrepreneurial. And if they're not, they're going to lose their workforce. Interestingly, I've done a, a mini study, like the most entrepreneurial com co company, uh, Google, I measured the ratio. So Google was number one, Facebook was number two, BCG was number three, McKinsey was number four. They let the people live. And they let the people create businesses. Uh, within the next five to six years, I think it's 50% of the workforce are going to be people who were born with a phone. But things will change. So again, I, I do think the joint venture makes a lot of sense. I do think having people from the inside who know the culture of a company who are customer-centric will make sense. And I think you have 10 trillion dollars of corporate capital that can put, put into innovation right now. That is not. And so I think it's going to be a no-brainer for everybody. It's, like, it's not innovation anymore. Like Everybody talks about transformation. Uh, and, uh, and like it's going to happen very fast and it's going to be very exciting. So my bet is the startup world is cool right now and corporate world is going to be very exciting in the next five to six years to come. So the one piece of advice I'd give if you're looking to partner with another company or brand is really to make sure you are providing enough value to that partner so that they want to provide you that value. Every partnership I've seen fail is when it's a lopsided relationship between the two entities, no matter what you're talking about. So to ensure that you actually get to you know, the best outcome, you need to really be focused on what value you're providing and then hope that you'll get that same value exchange in return. Otherwise, you know, there's just always gonna be a misalignment on you know, the relationship and the partnership. So you know, give it forward and you'll get it back is my advice on that. So it's 30 seconds each. What are your um, predictions for what you'll be working on next year? Since you've got these great things going on in 2016, 2017, what are you headed to do next? Okay. My prediction. Artificial intelligence will solve all of your problems. Every single one of them. Perfect. Go. <laughs> uh, I'm still caught in the virtual reality. I just think more to there. Some augmented reality. Fright fest zombies. I don't know. Go <laughs> ahead. I predict that the retail industry will not go away. I have no idea, uh, but <laughs> working in it, like we work with retail, work with telecommunication company. Uh, my bet is there's a revolution coming. People are tired of the way work is happening, I think, to relink with uh, the meaning you had before. And I think things are about to change. And, Spoken uh, like a true Frenchman, revolution yeah, the revolution coming yeah. yeah. People always uh, tone. But. CEOs, CEOs want this revolution. Board members want this revolution. Uh, and so I think it's going to be a lot of fun and there's going to be a lot of change. Yeah, so get ready for, for big, big moves. Everything changes and everything changes. Thank you guys so much. Give a round for our final place. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.